Well, welcome to the briefing room here at the River Lodge in uh, Reparoa, New Zealand. Tonight we're going to be looking at session three of our teaching on the Holy Spirit. Uh, you'll remember in session one we dealt with the character of the Holy Spirit. In last session we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we're going to be looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, by word of caution, it's important that you understand that neither one of these subjects in these sessions could possibly give you a really thorough understanding or teaching in this area. And it really is meant to be an overview. And so no doubt, especially as we get into the issue of the gifts uh, and then later in the fruits of the Spirit in our fourth session, uh, there, you may be left with a sense of desperation that your questions weren't necessarily addressed or answered. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll try to give an overview of uh, this topic tonight, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to begin by dealing with an issue of semantics. There is a difference between the gift of the Spirit, which you see referenced in Scripture, and the gifts of the Spirit. And it's important that you don't confuse the two aspects of the Spirit in that sense. The gift of the Spirit is given to you when you are born again. We dealt with this uh, in our last session in the work of the Holy Spirit within the life of a Christian. And of course, Acts 2.38 is a good example of that. That is the gift of the Spirit that happens when you are born again. Jesus is the giver. John chapter 16, verse 7 tells us that, that the one who gives the Holy Spirit and sends the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ, and the Spirit is here to do the work of Jesus Christ. And as a result, this produces the work of the Spirit in our life. So when we look at the work of the Spirit, we recognize that the Spirit is responsible for uh, our regeneration. That's what the Spirit does. Having drawn us out of the world by opening our eyes to the truth of the gospel, the Spirit in a regenerated, born-again believer is to provide that process of regeneration. The sanctification process in the believer is the second. Romans chapter 5 gives us insight into that setting apart. You are a chosen vessel now. In Christ, you are not your own. It's so important that people understand that relationship with God, that in Christ, you are not your own. The Spirit is our guarantee. There is that sense which the Spirit bears witness with our spirit, but the work of the Spirit is to be the guarantee of the purchase price. He's the occupier. John chapter 15, Jesus says that He is with you and will be in you. He says this to His disciples before His crucifixion and resurrection, speaking of a relationship which we would enjoy uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, as we uh, experience new life in Christ through that regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit occupies us. He is also our teacher. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 13, that He will come and give you those things which are mine. And, and, the, and the Spirit's work in the believer is to deliver to us the things that are are Christ. And of course, we then ended our study last week dealing with, or at least giving an overview of spirit baptism, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that reference to the third relationship where the spirit in the world is with us, as a believer is in us, and as we are empowered to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, the Spirit comes upon us to enable that work of being a witness. And so that's the work of the Spirit. But when we talk about the gifts, plural, of the Spirit, probably it would be better to refer to it as the gifts from the Spirit where the gift of the Spirit in the life of a believer is something that is given by Jesus Christ, and the gifts of the Spirit are given by the Spirit. And we'll make reference to that, uh, and the verses that make reference to that a little later. Paul, as he was writing to the Corinthian church in, Rome, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, really gives us the framework of what we're going to be working on tonight. In fact, it's very interesting that most that we will be dealing with tonight will come from Paul's 
epistles to the Corinthian church, who, by the way, were the most apparently the most charismatic of the churches uh, in the apostolic age, certainly uh, where the apostles were involved, uh, and that the Spirit seems to be uh, identifying this particular church. Uh, they were very charismatic, and yet as a result uh, of their desire for spiritual gifts and spiritual manifestations, Paul, of course, needed to teach them and correct them so that they would be uh, rightly responding to that which is a true work of the Holy Spirit. And so he begins in chapter 12, verse 1, by saying, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know, it is sad that this area of ignorance concerning the spiritual gifts has caused great division within the church. Partly because people on both sides of the question really don't know what they're talking about. I don't mean to be mean by saying that. What I am saying is it's an emotionally charged issue when it doesn't need to be. And as Paul is going to address this in 1 Corinthians, he addresses it in a manner that says, I don't want you to be ignorant. Here's something we need to understand. Ignorance leads to misunderstanding about differences. And then differences then cause disputes. Oh, you do it this way and I do it that way. How can the Spirit be there when you're doing this? Well, how can the Spirit be there when you're doing that? And so differences when they're not understood, lead to disputes. Disputes then cause division. Well, then you can just stay over there. You're obviously a heretic. Well, you're a heretic because you don't agree with me. And, and something which should be empowering to the body of Christ is one of the chief sources of division within the body of Christ. Something that is supposed to enable the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel becomes an end in itself rather than a means to the end, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It becomes an end in itself. And when disputes cause division, that ends in destruction. Jesus said when he was challenged about his ministry, whether it was from God or not, speaking of Satan, it says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And sadly, because of ignorance, the body of Christ, the local churches can have real disagreements when it comes to the area uh, of the aspects of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit. And not that I would presuppose that through this one study we would be able to settle all those issues, but we will certainly try to give you a biblical basis for um, Paul's teaching here, which I think gives us uh, the best balance on how to go forward. He continues in verse for by saying, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now, in that, Paul not only gives us a framework, but he gives us the objective of these gifts of the Holy Spirit. See, it's important that we understand the objective of why these gifts are given to us. For example, if you had a child and you were giving him a present and it was a shovel, a spade, and it was because your objective was you wanted to teach him gardening. And so uh, here's a present for you. You're going to really enjoy this, this spade. We're going to go out and, and we're going to plant seed and we're going to get working in the garden. And the kid looks at the spade and says, this would make a nice tool to bash my big brother over the head. And sometimes, in a, in a sort of a, a clumsy sort of a way, what I'm trying to say is we need to, to understand the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As with our last session, we talked about the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so I can feel good about myself or I can have some kind of a spiritual high. You may, in fact, as a result of it, feel a sense of spiritual awakening and you may feel very good. But that's not the purpose of it. That's a byproduct of it. The same thing here. The gifts of the Spirit are for the profit 
of the whole body of Christ. If we approached spiritual gifts in that manner, we would not have so much competition and, and differences and, and, and division over differences. The Greek word used here for gifts, of course, is charisma. And charisma uh, something is a word that we use quite often. Oh, he's a charismatic character. It's used, strangely enough, only 19 times in the New Testament. Notice as uh, Paul is laying out here, there's diversity of gifts. Those are manifestations. And we're going to address a few of those manifestations in this study this evening. There are differences of ministries. That is addressing administrations. So you can have many different manifestations, and then of each manifestation, you can have different administrations. How they are dealt with can be different. And then there's diversities of activities that is in operation. Basically, what you come up with is you come up with an appreciation that in the Spirit's work through born-again believers, there's a wide variety of spiritual activity. I like to put it this way. If we could know the total number of gifts, which by the time we get through this evening tonight, I think you may agree with me that that's a number that we cannot know. It's certainly more than most people uh, quickly identify. If we knew the number of gifts and then recognize that each of those gifts can have different ways in which they are administered, not the same. And then of each of those gifts which are administered different, there can be different activities associated with that administration. What you basically come up to as an understanding is that there is a great variety of the way in which the Spirit accomplishes the purpose of glorifying Jesus Christ. Now, it's important that we understand that. Within the ministry of Jesus Christ, here's a bit of homework for you to do on your own time, but I encourage you to do it. And that is this. In the gospel period, in the, in the gospel accounts, look at all the times that Jesus performed a miracle, a healing of some sort or another. And what you will discover is that he healed a number of blind people. He healed a number of lepers, and so on and so forth. But in no circumstance will they ever be exactly the same. There's always something fresh, always something new, and in many instances, something unexpected. Now, I'm not advocating that we do not exercise spiritual discipline here. But what I am trying to get across at this juncture is for us to understand that as we approach this idea of spiritual gifts, it's, there are far more variations of the way in which the Spirit works in individuals depending on all kinds of circumstances. Probably the most oft asked question of me concerning the gifts of the Spirit is when somebody comes to me with a little tiny list. They've been a Christian for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and they say, you know, I've been praying the Lord would give me a, a gift in the Spirit so I could be productive in the body of Christ. You know, and I'm looking at these nine gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, and I just don't see myself as having any one of those. It's because they're approaching it from the perspective that God is limited with regards to how He expresses Himself through the vessels which are now there to be vessels of honor to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And so, um, just, just a way of, of expressing the fact that Paul lays down, you don't need to be ignorant, and notice before he gets into the teaching on spiritual gifts, he then says, now you need to appreciate there are a diversity of gifts. And there's different kinds of administrations of those gifts. And then of those administrations, there's even different operations within the administration. So you see it as a multiplying factor in that sense. Paul continues in his instruction to the Corinthian church by saying, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit 
to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Please take note. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the call. He is the one who is going to deliver that which is necessary as He is now orchestrating the, the aspects of your life now that you are raised from the dead and you are Christ. But it's the same Spirit who's working in and through individuals. That's why when you have someone who wants to shoehorn God into a box that says, this is the way the Spirit moves, or this is the way the Spirit heals, or this is the way the Spirit works, as soon as I hear somebody trying to give you a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 type of a recipe for how we can direct the work of the Spirit, you automatically know you have somebody who is ignorant of spiritual things. Because you notice the way Paul is building this up. He says, don't be ignorant. God works in ways which are beyond our capacity to fully understand or appreciate. And that there are, and then he gives a list of nine. And some people stop here and say, oh, there are nine gifts of the Spirit. No, there aren't. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. A word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, Faith, how about that? Faith which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of healing, notice the plural there, gifts of healing. The working of miracles, plural. Prophecy, discerning of spirits. We'll spend some time talking about how important it is that we discern spirits. Different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now, Paul stops here because if you know anything about the history of the church in Corinth, you know that they had a real problem with the uh, audible gifts. And so he saves for last the last two gifts which were giving the church the most problem. And so he'll address that in more detail in chapter, uh, chapter 14 and we'll touch on that uh, during our study tonight. And so he looks at uh, these nine as he's addressing this church. To the Romans, he adds to that list six more. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many members are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to that grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, as we look at this list, you recognize that he's added some things which are the gifts of the Spirit. Not generally recognized as gifts of the Spirit. Prophecy, of course, he's repeated that. We dealt with that in, in 1 Corinthians 12. The sense of ministry. Ministry here is that of service one to another. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you have the capacity? Or do you want, or would you like to see the, the Lord minister through you in whatever capacity? Whether it's, it's verbally to someone as an individual or by serving them a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Ministering, serving them. Teaching that of giving instruction. Exhortation. That's a gift that is rarely appreciated when it's received. Nobody likes to be exhorted. But nonetheless, it's a necessary gift for the body. How about this one? That, that of giving and that it is to be with liberality. You know, I've met people who God has truly blessed. 
because they have a heart that just gives. They see themselves as a vessel used by God, but not a vessel as you and I might think of a vessel like a cup. They're a vessel that's more like a conduit through which as the Lord flows in, it flows back out again. And God sees that type of person as someone that He can enable to give. And God blesses them. Because it flows through the conduit. When you become a cup and begin to try to trap the reservoir, there's an example of that in Israel. The Jordan River starts up at Mount Hermon and makes its way down the mountains and flows through the Galilee. But then it reaches the Dead Sea where it stops. The Galilee is full of fish. The Dead Sea is dead. And that's the way people can be. You're either a Galilee or you're a Dead Sea. And that idea of giving with liberality, that individual who says, Lord, none of this is mine anyway. One of the most... uh, Uh, sometimes disturbing discussions that I can have with an individual is when they come to me and they're they're looking for someone to be a referee concerning their finances. And the question that oft is uh, given to me is, Ron, what's your position on tithing? And I'll I'll normally not ask them immediately. I'll I'll try to say, what's the the motivation behind this? Well, I'm struggling. Is it 10% of gross or 10% of net? And now do we take GST out of it? Or, you know, <laughs> I'm being ridiculous, but you get my, or can we take our electric and our, our, our property taxes out first? Because obviously those have nothing to do with us. And, and I'm just trying to figure out where my 10%. And I normally lead them down a line of question because eventually I'm going to get to my point. And that's simply this. I say to them, I don't believe in tithing, to which I love them when they go, Whew. no, I don't believe you should give God 10%. I think you should give him 100 And you get that sense of, that wasn't what I wanted to hear. Because that's the sense that we should all have. But some people are truly gifted in that area. They just have a liberal heart. And and I just love to see what God does through them. Another gift, he who leads with diligence. Leadership is one of those qualities that is not as easy as it appears. In fact, most people who God has led into leadership recognize that really what it means is you get to paint a great big target on your back. Some people follow that target. Other people shoot their arrows at it. And as a leader, really, that's that sense of being a shepherd. And so leadership is a gift. I had a person one time say to me, uh, he was concerned about you know, what his ministry gifts might be, and, and he said, I, I, I'd just like to know if God would like me to be a leader. I really do want to be a leader. I, I want to be a leader. And I, and I looked at this fellow and I said, the way you'll find out if you're a leader is if you follow the Lord and people follow you. But if you spend your time trying to get the people to follow you, you're not a leader. When people follow you, because you're following the Lord, then that's the type of person that's in biblical leadership. How about this one as a gift? He who shows mercy with cheerfulness as a gift of the Spirit. Mercy is an interesting quality. We're all familiar with grace. We love to say, I love the grace of God. Grace is unmerited favor, isn't it? We all want unmerited favor. Rarely do we really want justice unless it's for someone else. We certainly don't want God to treat us according to uh, His justice in the sense of us standing on our own right and righteousness before a holy and righteous God. No, we want to be standing in the righteousness of Christ justified by His work. But mercy is something which is interesting because it's a quality that many people overlook. Quality is not giving someone what they deserve. When we think of God's loving kindness toward us, it is His mercy which endures forever. 
And we trust in His mercy because if He wasn't a merciful God, the moment we break His law, we're toast. We're dead in that sense. Do you get what I'm getting at? And that's why we are told to show mercy one to another. Mercy is not pity. Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. So someone offends you, someone injures you, someone does something that really riles you up. You'd really like to let them have both barrels. Mercy, because that's a quality that God has, is something we need to see in our life. And in many instances, that ability to show mercy really is a gift of the Spirit. And we need to, we need to, to seek that and see that in our life, that mercy is a gift of the Spirit. Because it's not easy to do, is it? Mercy is very hard to give. When we see it as pity, wrongly defined, I can pity them, they're a bunch of idiots. But mercy, oh, I'd like to give it to that guy, you know, she deserves that. And, you know, and they haven't come to you and sought forgiveness. It's one of the questions people ask, you know, well, how far should you go when people have offended you? Well, you're to extend them unlimited mercy just like God extends you unlimited mercy. You can't forgive people who haven't, who haven't repented. Forgiveness is the gift that is offered to repentance. But what you are obligated to give is mercy. We're to be merciful to those who have injured us. Here's another gift that people overlook, celibacy. That's not one that's high on a lot of people's list, but Paul makes reference to it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. He says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Now, I chose just a portion of where he makes a reference to the fact that at this time in his life, he was single. Now, most biblical scholars believe that Paul was, first of all, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And if so, uh, he would have been a rabbi, and to be in that position, he would have been married. And many people have speculated, there's nothing in Scripture to tell us what happened to Paul's wife. Nonetheless, at the time of his conversion and his public ministry, he is single, he makes reference to it. But he calls it a gift from the Spirit his ability to not desire to be married. In that sense, that is a, what he calls a eunuch made by God. And that's a gift of the Spirit. Celibacy, in that sense, Paul explains to the Corinthian church, means that the person can be wholly and totally devoted. And it's another way to... Um, uh, to identify a person who's just devoted to the Lord. He says, you know, if you, if, if you, if you can be a, a celibate and be devoted to the Lord, you'll be more productive. You won't have the cares of this world. But if you can't, then marry, he says. In Ephesians chapter 4, he adds a few more gifts. Beginning in verse 10, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And so in this list, these are positions. But as positions, they are gifts. Apostles, of course, are those who saw Christ and were an eyewitness. Now, a broad interpretation of the word apostle just simply means one who is sent out. That's why when you have some people go around today saying, I'm apostle this and apostle that. Well, they're taking a broad understanding, which is not inaccurate in the sense of the use of the word apostle. But then again, every time you send your children to the local milk bar to pick up a pie for you, they're your apostle. So you should call your children's apostles then. You see what I'm saying? You can get silly with these terms, by the way. And I just, I intentionally sort of uh, use that example so that we don't get caught up with these titles. But it simply means those who are sent out. Paul's the one who defines uh, what, a, uh, uh, what apostolic authority is. It had to do with the establishment of the foundational doctrines of the church 
And Paul saw himself as an apostle born out of season because he physically was sent out by Jesus Christ after the resurrection in deference to those who were part of the public ministry of Jesus Christ who were sent out by him. All right. So the apostles' prophets, we've dealt with that. These are the people that foretell and foretell the word of the Lord. In other words, they deliver God's word but they also tell the future. And so there are two aspects to being a prophet. Evangelist, we've dealt with that in a lot of detail in our uh, two-part briefing series called The Gospel, where we deal with the evangelist, and also on our briefing package called The Great Commission. The evangelist is an individual who has a specific message, which is the message of reconciliation. We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. The evangelist is the one who goes and proclaims the message of reconciliation to the world, which we know as the gospel. Pastors, overseers, really uh, are those who are tending the flock. They're shepherds. Uh, and uh, many people use this term pastor as, again, some kind of an exalted term, uh, when in fact it simply means the one who is serving for the needs within uh, the local fellowships of, uh, of Christians. And teachers, of course, uh, as a position and as a gift, this is also, uh, uh, Paul repeats this, but in terms of, of individual uh, uh, types of, of gifts within the church, the teacher is then one who is taking the bread and breaking it and offering it in explanation. Evangelists make a proclamation. Teachers give an explanation. Uh, and uh, that's what we're hopefully doing uh, in our session tonight. We are teaching. Now, one observation I want us to be sensitive to, and that is that although we have gone through uh, about 19 gifts, depending on how you number them, uh, I don't think this is an exhaustive list. In the same way in which we don't have an exhaustive list of all the miracles that Jesus performed. John tells us that. He says if, if, we be, if we try to write down all that could be written concerning the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, I, I, he says, I suppose it will fill the, all the libraries in the world. So what we're given is a selected list to give us an appreciation for what is taking place. It's not a definitive list. And it's also important for us to notice that in many cases... In fact, I hesitate to say that in most cases we'll find that these are not permanent gifts. Oh, I have the gift of this, or I have the gift of that. It's an enabling that God gives in the moment for that purpose. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go down through some of the specific gifts. But it is something I need you to be sensitive to because there is this almost one-upmanship that can happen within charismatic fellowships where it's almost like, uh, you know, scout uh, badges, you know, and what gifts do you have? Well, I have the gift of this and I have the gift of that, you know. And they're always the, the, the flamboyant was, you know, I have the gift of wisdom, Wow, okay, that's good. And also discretion, I can see. Uh, I have the gift of prophecy. I, I've, I've not met many who say, I, I have the gift of not telling anyone my gift. I have the gift of cleaning toilets. You know, I have the gift of quiet works. You see, what's to brag about that? And, and when you get into this trying to say, I have that gift, as if somehow it's, it's a, a set of badges that go on the lapel of your jacket, it's a dangerous place, and I'll show you examples where that is not the case, even among the apostles, as reported in the book of Acts, that things occurred and happened as it was necessary for the Spirit to accomplish the work at that time. And it's important that they were given by the Holy Spirit as He deems it important. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 tells that. He gives it as He wills. We don't play nor direct that work. Now, when we look at just these nine gifts, we could have gone through the 19, but for the sake of time, we'll go through the, the nine gifts that are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll, 
we'll look a little bit uh, in detail with regards to how they're described. In other words, some of their administration. We've talked about the diversity of gifts. We've shown you at least 19. But we're now going to look at these nine and look at their administration. In other words, how do they actually uh, evidence themselves? We'll start with the word of wisdom. It is the Greek phrase logo Sophia. Sophia, the word uh, wisdom, Sophia, is used 59, or 51 times in the New Testament. And when you look at it in context, it's always referring to wisdom that is from God. Wisdom, when you define the difference between knowledge and wisdom, wisdom is experience-based knowledge. You can have knowledge. You can go to school. Women, you can learn about childbearing. And then you have a child. That knowledge can be useful to you. But after you've experienced childbearing, now you have the wisdom of childbearing. You've, ex you've, you've put to practice that knowledge and you have experience now that, that gives it maturity. And that's what wisdom is. That's why wisdom is found not in um, necessarily the novice. It's dangerous to go try to find wisdom from young counterparts. Wisdom is found in the way of those who are covered with the scars of the decisions they made in life. That's the person that you want to see. You want to go, as it were, to the old man of the sea. Wisdom. And so when we speak of the word of wisdom, we're talking about the capacity to, to address something which is beyond your experience base. To, to speak into something which is beyond not only your knowledge, more importantly, your experience. Jesus promised this to his disciples. He said, therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or to resist. Jesus preparing his disciples for the fact that after he had departed, they would be drawn before tribunals and so on and so forth. He didn't want them to worry about that. He would give them what they needed in that hour. They would have the word of wisdom and it would come out. And we see in the book of Acts that happening often. Individuals who seem to flounder prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter, the greatest example, he all of a sudden waxed lyrical after the day of Pentecost. Man, he just, he's on fire. He's hitting on all cylinders. And that's that word of wisdom, as if it all sort of came home and made sense. But it's not something that he is generating. It's a word of wisdom that is there. It's a steadying word of experience in an area where you may not necessarily have of that experience. So that's a gift of the Spirit. The word of knowledge. The Greek word knowledge here is gnosis, and it's only used 29 times in the New Testament. It implies a full or complete understanding, not just a general awareness, but a real, intimate, detailed knowledge. You know, we have this uh, situation recorded in Acts chapter 8 where uh, Peter uh, hears of uh, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, people are coming to the Lord uh, in Samaria. And he goes there and he prays for the people. And as he lays his hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. And in the crowd is a man named Simon who was previously a sorcerer. And uh, he sees it. And we pick it up in verse 20. And he offers money. And, and so Peter said to him, your money perishes with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity." 
Do you see a lot of knowledge that he has there? He's never met this man. We know by Luke, uh, by um, uh, uh, Luke's uh, account of the book of Acts that uh, who this character is, but we know that because the, uh, the narrator has told us what his background is. But you need to appreciate, Peter is coming into Samaria, doesn't know this man from Adam. And then as the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the, the fellowship of people there, he makes a misstatement, and all of a sudden Peter just has the word of knowledge. Your heart is in the wrong place. You know, we're told in Scripture to be very careful about judging another person's heart, because we can't see that. But in the word of knowledge, you have knowledge, and you're able to immediately address something. I've heard of ministers who uh, stand, uh, have stood in the pulpit and, and felt as a result of uh, a, a, an explanation they wanted to give a, a fictitious story. And so this one fellow was standing in the pulpit, and he says, for, he's going to talk about uh, people sort of indulging themselves and and uh, so he said, it'd be like, it would be like a fellow who decided to go out today and, you know, uh, and, and really uh, congratulate himself on what a great life he was living and go out and buy himself a fancy car. And, and he names the car and names the color. And, and he says, oh, it's white Cadillac and so on and so forth. And you've been driving around the neighborhood just showing off. And after, you know, and he just used it as an example, uh, like a, just a, fic a fiction. And uh, afterwards... Um, a uh, fella comes up to him, just be red. How dare you? He said, how dare you? You know, make fun of me like that in front of the whole church fellowship. And the pastor's like, what are you talking about? He says, man, you just you nailed it right there. I just bought a white Cadillac and I drove it around the neighborhood. And, and uh, I can't believe that you would, you know, openly rebuke me like that, you know. But, but the, word of the word of knowledge comes like that. It's, it's not something, in fact, that you will necessarily even be aware of. It'll just be something that it will just occur to you, and you'll say, this is the problem, isn't it? You'll see somebody disturbed about something, and the Lord will just open it up, and you'll say, this is what's bothering you, isn't it? Yes, how did you know that? Who's been talking to you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just... And that will come as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Faith. It means... a a type of faith which is trusting in God. This isn't the type of faith that necessarily that we, a responsive faith, this is a faith where we put our trust in God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Now when you recognize the scripture also tells us that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, you recognize that there is a faith which is a gift from God, which is unto belief, unto everlasting life. And then there is a faith by which we live our life. And that faith produces work. And that's what Hebrews chapter 11 is all about. It's called the hall of faith because... By faith, these people did these various things. The byproduct of their faith was not simply to have a belief system, but rather it motivated them to produce works. Gifts of healing. These are those miraculous answers to prayer, which we all look for when we need them. The book of Acts is full of instances of sudden healing. The Gospels, of course, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Sudden healing. We have this situation that took place in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Peter and James at the gate beautiful. Here is a man who had been lame for 40 years, and every day he was brought and set by the gate beautiful. Which means during the 30 year plus ministry and life of Jesus Christ, he would have walked by him. It's one of those things that when you put that parallel truth together, it's astonishing. And these guys would have been used to seeing him there. You know, how many of you notice a road, road sign that's, that's been up for 40 years and never changed? Pretty soon you just become blind to it. But as you get in, in Acts chapter 3, you recognize that these men walked by this person who has been sitting there for 40 years. And it says, and Peter looked at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. 
and said, Silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and be healed. Why didn't you do that before, Peter? Because it was at that moment the Spirit moved his heart and he proclaimed that which would bring glory to Jesus Christ. You see, James chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, uh, 14, tells us that we are to ask for healing. Verse 14 says, Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. It's a wonderful promise. And I wish it was the only passage in Scripture that dealt with the issue of healing. Because it would be a slam dunk in my mind. It would be the idea that says, there it is. All we got to do is just do that. And there we go. We're going to have healing. But it, we have this nagging question. Are all healed? You see, if you are used to building theology on single verses or single portions of Scripture, people love to latch on to uh, James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 and latch on to that and just say it over and over again. But what's important is, is to recognize that the answer to that question is given to us in Scripture itself. Paul had something he called the thorn in the flesh. He tells the Corinthians about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 8. He says, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What is Paul doing here? He's admitting that he applied James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, three times. Lord, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm coming to you with this infirmity. Take it away. And the answer came booming back. No. My grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because if we truly are gods, then not just our heart, but our body belongs to Him. And if He chooses for His purposes to accomplish His will in this manner, who as, who as the clay can say to the potter, why have you made me thus? We are to ask, and we're to ask in faith believing, no doubt about it. We have this strange advice of Paul to Timothy. No longer drink water only, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. What? He was a disciple of Paul. Paul doesn't say, hey man, go back and just remember James 5, 14 and 15. Do it. Get some elders to anoint you and put oil over you. You, just, you don't have enough faith, man. In this case, he says, take some medicine. We have this salutation to Timothy. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of uh, Anisiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Tromephius I have left in Melita sick. What? Tromephius, he's one of your servants. Why didn't you just do your Paul thing, man? I've read the book of Acts. You, you've done all kinds of miracles. In Ephesus, they took the sweatbands from your wrist. And they laid them upon the sick and they were healed. You had nothing to do with it. People brought sick people out into the streets that perhaps your shadow would touch them and they were healed. And yet one of your own disciples is in Melita sick. Why? What about Isaiah chapter 53? Verses 4 and 5, another favorite passage for people who love to cling to isolated verses because they want to believe that if they have enough faith, they will be healed. They love to quote chapter, or verse 4 and 5. Surely He has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And he was, but He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. The number of times I've had people quote that to me, of course, by His stripes we are healed. What about that? Well, there's 
a way of interpreting Scripture which is important for us to recognize and understand, and that is you always interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. The New Testament brings to light the mystery of the Old Testament. Peter actually quotes from this passage. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth, who, when He was reviled, did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but committed Himself to Him who judges righteously." who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. What is the stripes of the cross of Christ healing? They are healing us from our terminal illness of sin. That's how Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 is interpreted by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Peter in the New Testament. That's why it's important to come with the whole counsel of God concerning this. That when we see Him bearing in His body that which He is clearing us for, the atonement pays for our sins by whose stripes you were healed. Let's move on. The working of miracles. The word miracle here is dunamis. And those of you that are familiar with charismatic themes know that dunamis means power. It's used 123 times in the New Testament. But strangely enough, it's only translated nine times as miracles. So the working of power rather than just the working of miracles. It can also be translated power 71 times as strength seven times, as might four times, and as virtue three times. So the idea of the working of miracles is a translator's choice of words. It can also be the outworking of power in your life. What power? Power to do all kinds of things. Which is miraculous. Let me tell you what. I know my character. And when I see myself responding against the natural sense of my own character, I know that has to be a gift from God. That's not natural for me to act that way. And so when we think of work of miracles, let's don't simply segregate that and, and make that simply the signs and wonders, which are certainly uh, appropriate to do so. But... But it can also simply mean the working of power in your life, spiritual power in your life. You see, miracles were signs following the apostles. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, tells us, For I determined, Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in meekness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice the use of power, dunamis, 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 that I was doing these things in the power of God, producing that which brings glory to God, but it was all by the power of God, not of us. One of the things that saddens me is when I do see things that are being reported as works of the Spirit, which the net result seems to be nothing more than the glorification of the supposed vessel. Wow, look at how powerful that guy is. Which of us would say to a scalpel that was in the hand of a skillful surgeon after the completion of the operation, wow, can you show me that scalpel? I just want to stand and just worship that scalpel. No, it was just an instrument in the hand of the surgeon. You need to recognize God has used all kinds of strange creatures to accomplish His purpose. Donkeys in the Old Testament and donkeys in the New Testament. So we need to appreciate the fact that the working of miracles is something 
that God does use to verify and validate. There were miracles at Corinth that Paul makes reference to. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. No doubt. I, don't get me wrong here. I love to see things that are miraculous, which are supernatural. But they happen in God's ways, in God's timing, and He is always the one that gets the credit. I remember as a youngster, uh, uh, you know, going to meetings where they would say, next Saturday we're going to have a miracle service. And I used to always wonder as a kid, how do they know? How do they know He's going to do a miracle then? Well, they were leading everyone to believe that if you brought this guy, he's got this ability and he'll bring it to us. And so what did that cause all the people in the church to do? To look to the individual. Oh, such and such is coming to town. Great, man. I'm going to go get all my neighbors and I'm going to tell them about the Lord and bring them down there and, and they're going to learn. Wow. That's not the way the New Testament worked. In every incident where you see a public miracle takes place at the hand of the uh, apostles, they're immediately saying, don't look at me as if by my righteousness this man stands here before you whole. Sadly, today, an opportunity like that came along, boy, we'd be on TV worldwide and they'd be selling our books and, and, uh, because it's all about me. Because I want to tell you why God chose me. And of course, that really misplaces where the glory is supposed to be. It's supposed to be with God Himself. The gift of prophecy. So much we could say here. It's only used, this word is only used 19 times in the New Testament, strangely enough. It primarily means prediction of the future, by the way. It can mean forthtelling, in other words, making a declaration, thus saith the Lord. That is also prophecy. Be careful, by the way, uh, it's, a, it's a trap that many people can fall into. They can fall into the trap of saying, Thus saith the Lord when the Lord hasn't spoken. You've got to be careful about that. Jeremiah complained. There are prophets around saying, Thus saith the Lord and the Lord hasn't spoken. Be careful of saying, Hey, this is what the Lord would say to you today. When people come, in and people come up and say to me, i got a word of the Lord for you, I'll say, Wow, let me sit down. I've got a, I'm gonna, seriously? This is like... I'm going to really, can we record this or write this down? Or No, it's just the word of the Lord. I just, you know, kind of was sitting there and I want to tell you something. Well, is it a word of the Lord or not? Or is it a, a personal unction that you feel or a desire that you want to communicate to me? Do you see what I'm saying? We, we wrongly use that term, word of the Lord, too often. Prophecy is very serious. In the Old Testament, if you gave a prophecy that didn't come true, they stoned you. Now... There are guys running around plaguing the church today who call themselves prophets, who make all kinds of predictions that nobody holds them accountable. Shame on them. And shame on the people who enable them to stay in ministry. Prophecy. It is seen as one of the best gifts for the church. 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's that word of the Lord that comes out. It's prophetic. And I have met people who have that prophetic word, not necessarily in the predicting of the future, but in the sense of putting their finger on critical issues uh, that need to be addressed and, it's, and it brings edification and exhortation and comfort and it's a prophetic word. But we are told that when someone utters something that is classed as prophecy, we are to judge it. Ooh, this makes people very uncomfortable. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Oh, that we would practice that today. These guys going around saying, thus saith the Lord this, thus saith the Lord that. And if you go up to them and say, I'd like to challenge you on that. You're immediately rebuffed with that sense of, don't you try to quench the Spirit. 
Don't you, didn't you hear what I said? God's told me this. Well, if God told you that, then can you explain this to me? Why is it in contradiction with what the scripture says over here? You see, truth never is afraid of being tested. And so if they declare truth, they should never worry about somebody saying, can I test that please? I went to a, a meeting one time where uh, when they would have individuals who would stand up and say, I really feel like I have a word of the Lord. They had a scribe in the room and they'd say, stop everybody, stop. And they would record exactly what the fellow said. Now, if it was a word of exhortation or encouragement, I mean, you know, fine, fair enough. But if there was any predictive component of it, they would, they would copy it, they would date it, and they would remind everyone in the room that they were going to be measured against what they said, thus saith the Lord. Guess what? That rarely happened. When you put testing in the middle of a lot of this foolishness that's going a lot around, a lot of that stuff evaporates. Strangely, isn't it interesting, the next gift Paul deals with is discerning of spirits. That's that type of critical analysis. The Greek term literally means a judicial estimation. In other words, to pass judgment. Oh, oh, I thought Christians weren't supposed to judge one another. No, we're not to judge one another's heart because we are not God. But we are to judge the fruit that's on the tree. We are to judge. And so when we are dealing with discerning of spirits, we are told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, I've been in those charismatic type services where when, when the quote spirit begins to move, if you begin to question what's happening there, boy, you're immediately the big black stamp goes across your forehead. Oh man, he's a non-believer that boy. You're going to quench the spirit here. To which I say, I sure hope so. I want to quench a false spirit. I want to be the quench of something that's false. Why not? But people are so afraid of that. Test the spirits. There you go. There's, that's really how to deal with it. Let's get this out. To see. The, the Bible says that at end times, there will be lying signs and wonders. Are we paying attention to that prediction? In Acts chapter 16, Paul was in Philippi, and it happened as he went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her master much profit by fortune-telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. Now, I don't know if you've ever paused to think about that passage in Acts chapter 16, but to recognize... What takes place? How did he know? She said everything that was right. She didn't say a lie. She says, these are the men that declare to us the way of salvation. How did he know? Because he was given at that point the gift of discerning of spirits. And he was annoyed by it. And he recognized, ah, this is if you can't beat them, join them kind of spiritual warfare. I'm going to come along and I'm going to masquerade as the Holy Spirit because she was looking for uh, a chance to be validated. And there's a lot of spiritual activity by people who are like this soothsayer, who are masquerading as presenting the Spirit of God when they are not. And, and Paul had the discerning of spirits to be able to determine, hey, this isn't the Lord speaking, this is a demon. You know, don't, don't get that Hollywood idea of what demons, how they reveal themselves. You know, and, and uh, you know, they make you hiss when you talk and, and you know, you look like a snakehead or something, you know. And uh, it's perfect, and, you, and your face gets all red or something. No. He presents himself as an angel of light. Next, we see different kinds of tongues. The Greek word there is glossia. 
it is translated tongue or language. What's important for us to recognize is this is not some random babble. It is a language. In every place that it is translated in the New Testament, it is a language, not repetitive babble. It is not tongues. Tongues are always translated, when they are translated, as praise, interestingly enough. Acts chapter 2, we read in verse 6, When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. When the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost, there were people from all over the place came and they heard in their own language. Verse 11, Cretans and Arabs, we heard them speaking in our own tongues. What? The wonderful works of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. Paul says, Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? The context there is, and I commend to you the whole of chapter 14, to go read it in its entirety. You'll discover that Paul is saying to them, Look, you guys are out of control because you're just being silly. And you're exalting yourself in what you believe is some kind of an authentic spiritual manifestation, which is isn't and it's out of control and it causes nothing but confusion notice what he says when tongues at the day of pentecost as specified here in 1 corinthians chapter 14 how can we agree with you in prayer or in your praise and the praise is being translated in that you're giving thanks now in the whole of chapter 14 Paul gives a comprehensive teaching on the proper use of tongues, both private and public. And I, we don't have enough time to go through that here, but nonetheless, it is something that you need to spend some, a considerable amount of time reading the whole chapter in its context, not just cherry-picking things uh, through it here. The interpretation of tongues. It literally means the translation of tongues. Every time tongues are in, uh, interpreted um, in Scripture, they're interpreted as praise and worship, and it's always directed to God. There are never a message from God. I was raised in a Pentecostal church where we had every week a message from God, and it would be somebody would stand up in the church, they would say something in an unknown tongue of some sort or another, and then someone would be an awkward pause, and then someone would stand up and say, "My little children," and then you know, and they would tell you something, and that was called. A, and we all waited every Sunday. You wanted a message from God. You will not see any messages like that in the New Testament anywhere, and yet it's widely practiced in churches today. That's not what the Scriptures say at all. The interpretation of tongues. Peter at Pentecost is quoting from Joel chapter two. But this is what was spoken of by Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're familiar with that passage of what is about to happen. And Paul or Peter is using this. Joel prophesied. And this is the fulfillment of that. When we have people ask the question, are the gifts for today? Paul then goes on in chapter 2, verse 38, and Peter, or, or, excuse me, Peter goes on and says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter really answers that question which Sadly, 
down through the ages, there have been who have said, those who have said, well, the gifts of the Spirit were for the apostolic age, but now, of course, uh, since the completion of the canon of the New Testament, we no longer need the work of the Spirit through these gifts anymore. Well, does the church need the gifts of the Spirit today? Well, let's take a look at those gifts. Do we not need wisdom? Do we not need knowledge or faith or healings? The working of miracle or power? The word of declaring the word of the Lord, prophecy. We certainly need the discerning of spirits. The use of the different types of tongues and all that can be said there. There's a whole Bible study that you can get in just looking at the use, the proper use of the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Of course, the church needs ministry and teaching and exhortation. It needs people to give liberally. It needs leaders and those who show mercy. It benefits from those who are sent out, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. As Peter said, that it's for you and for your children and unto everyone who believes. And so I'm one of those who clearly believes that the gifts are for today, but they need to all be done decently and in order. So we've looked in this session with the, to, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and in our next session we'll be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow our heart before you, we recognize that this is a subject, Lord, which we can't possibly cram into the short amount of time that we've given it. And we appreciate the fact that as we, as believers, trust in you, that your Spirit will lead us into all truth. Lord, that we don't have to rely upon the cleverness of man or the words of man to, to understand the things of the Spirit, for they're spiritually discerned. You give us eyesight for that. And Father, I pray that even as we consider the verses that have been laid out before us in the commentary, Lord, that you would uh, promote that which is true and right and righteous and, and acknowledges and glorifies you, Lord, and everything else, is, Lord, it may be blown away as, as, as chaff, Lord. For, Father, we want to see you rightly represented and the Spirit's work uh, rightly addressed in our life. And so, Father, we just thank you. And, and uh, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we just pray all of these things. Amen.